Okay, great. Well, welcome um, everyone who is out there um, listening to us. Um, I'm Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and this is another conversation with a superintendent. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the reopening of school contingency plan. Um, each time I have different guests, um, and so tonight I'm lucky because I have two distinguished guests here with me. So I have Nelly Vaquera Boggs, who is the president of Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, and then so she'll be. And then I have Leticia Orapesa, who is president for California um, School Employee Association. Yes, and, hello uh, everyone. So it's so great to have both of them here. And then as always with me, I have Alicia Jimenez, who is our public information officer and is working on the questions behind the scenes of um, what people are asking. Um, so we always, um, just so, so that everyone knows what the goal is, is to be able to have the public really engage with us regarding topics that they find important. Um, and so we have done everything from food insecurity to budget, and now we are looking at um, contingency plan. And so um, I am going to share my screen just really quick um, so that um, I can show the contingency plan. I'm not going to go over um, the entire contingency plan. I'm just going to highlight a few um a few pages of it um, so that everyone knows. So parents, community, you should have received the final um, first draft of the final draft of the contingency plan. I know there was a contingency plan that was released on Wednesday at the board meeting, but the one that you received on Friday um, has all the live links. And I'm gonna kind of show you how to navigate that. Um, we want to, you know, just the message that's up here really builds on three points. Um, one is that this entire plan is based on ensuring two key things. One, the health and safety of our student staff and community. And then two, really providing high quality instruction um, for our students for the upcoming school year. Um, I do think um, both um, PBFT and CSEA for having such great groups of um, staff being helping to support um, the collaborative effort of the first draft. I do want to note that um, the plan is not static at this time. So there's still several things that need to happen. One, things are constantly changing with the local, state, and federal um, guidelines. Um, we are going to be taking the survey feedback. We do have now over 1,400 people already responding to the survey. Um, and then lastly, um, we do still have um, negotiations with our two um, bargaining um, units um, to ensure that we are ready for our students um, when it comes to August so that we're all on the same page and that we're ready to go um, to help support our students. Um, so uh, for everyone that is out there, when you're looking at the document, this right here, this button takes you specifically to the survey. So if you're wondering about um, the survey, you just click right there and it takes you to the survey. Um, there really are these four guiding principles that we um, care about. So first and foremost, are we keeping students and staff safe and healthy? If our students aren't healthy, they can't come to school. If our staff is not healthy, they cannot come to work and therefore serve our students. So really making sure that we're keeping that in the forefront. We know that high quality instruction is very important to our students. And so we're working diligently to make sure everyone has the tools and professional development they need in order to reach that. And then systemic inequities. So we're looking at the most fragile student that in the school district and working out from there. So if you have, whether it's a student that is not, not participating within distance learning or a student with special needs or an English learner, it's what, did that, what does that child need and we're building the system from there. And then 
continue to communicate. So identify ways in which we are communicating with all the people that are around this fear, right? Everyone in order to ensure that there are reciprocal ways of um, providing um, feedback and listening. So um, you will see that many of these things have already occurred. So we had the planning team, there was about 50 of us that were working together. We did the initial needs assessment. Um, we went out and had some community partners providing support. We had the board meeting where the, the first draft was released. It now is out to the community to be able to provide um, contingency plan feedback. And like I said, we've received a lot of really great feedback already. And then the teams are gonna come back together and really hash out the feedback from all the partners and work together on a final draft um, that, is, that is regulated. One thing um, when we, this is the results from the first survey. I'm only gonna highlight a few of them. Um, so what you'll see in the biggest concerns now, when you see these three concerns, these are all things which we, you should see addressed within the plan. So you'll see that we're looking at how can we provide a daily routine and schedule for our students? Um, how can we um, pre prevent that social isolation? Um, really taking care of their health concerns. Um, and then um, the three, I want to note that the three concerns for every single group um, was the exact same. So mean, minimizing health risk for students and staff consistency on how students learn and that um, teachers and staff are adequately trained. Um, and then there were these three different um, preferences. You're receiving that same question on the current survey. Um, and you'll see that we had about 20% of the adults that said they would prefer a distance only. Um, in the 30s, almost 40s for physically, and then a combination um, was 40 to 50% here. Um, students, of course, um, did talk a lot about wanting to go physically back to school. Um, I'm gonna end um, on this slide um, because what I wanted, or one more slide, I'm gonna orient you. So something that I continue to hear is um, that um, we are able to do things that are not, um, that, the health department does not recommend. That's not accurate. We do not determine what is high risk, medium risk, low risk. We also do not, because we are not the health professionals, we do not determine, for example, if students must wear face coverings. The governor just came out and said that any person over the age of three within a school should be wearing a face covering. And so I mentioned that because a lot of the questions that I saw that came in before tonight, um, before, or that came in today before this, um, talked a lot about the face coverings and why is it being required. Um, and it is a requirement from our governor, and it is something that we also feel needs to be put in place in order to ensure the health and safety of your very own children and our staff. Um, so these are the models that we have, um, that we are proposing and people are providing their feedback on. Um, many of them in the high risk do um, require many of the students to be um, in distance learning or at least the hybrid. Um, and um, we're doing that in an effort to be able to put the resources that we need onto the elementary site. So we want to make sure that we have enough custodial, we have enough supervision, bus drivers to be able to support the higher level of, um, of cleaning, the higher level of supervision um, that we need when we're trying to ensure that students are physically distancing from each other. This, um, some parents have said that the document is a little challenging, so I want to explain how you can go there. So for example, if health and safety is your number, is something you care about and you wanna know, so what are they doing with cleaning and sanitizing? These are hot links that you can go directly to it. 
and it takes you directly to the area in which it is. Um, and so I encourage you to um, look at the document. You will see that um, for each category, um, there are the three different levels um, with us focusing right now on um, the high risk component. And um, I will stop sharing and go to some questions from Alicia. So you're, you're on mute, Alicia. Sometimes that would be appreciated, but not today. <laughs> we have over 90 respondents. I'm very excited about the amount of interest out there. And I do have one question, Doctora. The, there's a few that fall under the mass requirements. So I'm going to read it out and they're mostly from parents. Will fa uh, face masks be required? I keep hearing that students, especially younger students, won't have to wear masks. Since masks protect others, how will other students and teachers and families, they all come home to be protected? And, and they also ask if the school would be providing the masks for the children. And, um, and will per personal items like water bottles and backpacks be allowed at school? Okay, would great. you be able to talk about that, Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, I would. So we are going, so currently all, anyone that is in a public um, indoor space that is three or older um, must wear a face mask. Um, we are in the process of purchasing because we believe it will be best for our younger children. We're in the process of purchasing the face shields, which allow the clear, transparent um, covering to occur. Um, it will help the students because they it won't be touching their face and it also will allow them to not have to move it as much. It also cleans much easier um, than, the, than the face mask. So we are going to be receiving from CDE, we are receiving two cloth face masks, so similar to this, two um, cloth face masks and two paper um, face mask for each child. Um, and then apart from that, then PVUSD will be providing the face shields, um, which our staff will also have um, so that we can do several things. One, we can see their faces so we can see how they're learning much better. Um, two, um, it will allow for better social interaction, right? So it, I've been telling people, I'm not sure if others feel the same, but for me, it's it's a challenge when I cannot see someone's facial expressions. I much prefer to, to see that. Um, and then three, with cleanliness and being able to clean, um, it's definitely easier to clean um, the um, the face shield than it is um, the um, the cloth mask, especially during school time. Um, and so, um, currently, all all people will be wearing the face mask and we will be providing them for them. Wonderful. Thank you, Doctora. Yeah. I think this is a good time uh, for us to hear a little bit from uh, Nelly Vaquera Boggs. If you can give us, uh, Nelly, a, a perspective of PVFT and the top priorities for reopening. Yeah, thank you. Thanks uh, for having me here. Um, nice to see your faces. Uh, so. Uh, PBFT, our number one is also safety. Uh, being the representative of the um, educators, uh, we also advocate through our educators for our students. So um, safety is important. We don't want teachers to be teaching in trauma. Um, it's, that's really important that our teachers are, are able to be present and not be um, afraid and, and or worried about potentially be becoming ill. So ensuring that our teachers and our educators, anybody, and our people working with each other um, are going to be provided the appropriate um, protective gear. And aside from that, when we do, when or if we do go back into um, a, a, a partial reopening where we have, we, we're gonna be asking for smaller class sizes. So we're basing it on science. We're asking for everything to be based on science to be based on the research, to um, also be um, based on the guidelines presented by the CDE, by the state, and also our national um, affiliate, the American Federation of Teachers. They also have um, a reopening guideline as well. So, um, and 
So we have been part of the contingency planning team since May. And so that was really great when we, when Dr. Rodriguez and I um, began to speak about that back in late April, actually, and, and how the importance of ensuring that all of us stakeholders are um, at the table talking about concerns and priorities for um, any type of potential plan for re reopening, because um, it's important that everybody is safe. Ensuring that we have the funding to, um, to ensure that we're, if we're going to go into reopening of any kind, that we have the staffing, that we have of the funding to provide the, the um, added gear to have training for our teachers if we're going to be doing discontinued distance learning. Um, and most importantly, before we start the school year, um, we've been advocating that one of our professional development days, uh, we have two at the very beginning, that one of those be dedicated to training all staff, because as we saw in the survey, that is an important um, aspect that parents and students are also um, concerned about. So we believe that one of those PD days should be dedicated to training our members um, and all people involved in, in reopening. Um, so those are priorities as well as for, um, for the expectations on distance learning. We are um, hopeful that we can have an MOU that encompasses all of those aspects. So not separate from here's the expectations and here is, um, here's an actual MOU on, on impacts, but that it is an all encompassing memorandum of understanding that um, we can refer to that has expectations and all the other impacts to our contract as we negotiate the impacts to our contract. Um, and we were grateful that the, um, Dr. Rodriguez understood the need to separate negotiations out between elementary and secondary, and then we have early childhood, um, there's adult ed, and, and an all-encompassing SELPA because that is an important piece of our district, and that's um, being that we serve a high percentage of students um, who, who fall under SELPA. So um, ensuring that we can continue in good faith to negotiate those impacts to ensure that our teachers are safe and that our students are safe because we always, always end with our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. And so within the scope of the distance learning expectations, we still strive to provide high quality education, but that understanding that it, it's not a straight translation from the classroom to dig digital learning. Um, but this is also a time to reimagine education in general. And, um, and Dr. Rodriguez and I had, have spoken very minimally in regards to the virtual school. So the virtual academy. So that's something that's still in the talk and talks. And I know that our members are, are asking about that because it is important that our members are able to teach. And if we have many who um, care for their parents who have a child who is immunocompromised or they themselves are immunocompromised, they should still be granted that ability to practice their profession and teach our students in our community. And so ensuring that we have a process to identify those um, teachers who can continue to teach through um, distance learning, virtual academy, and then those that are able to go back into the classroom to teach students in smaller class sizes. Thank you. Wonderful, Letty. You know, since Nelly. you mentioned, um, <laughs> perdóname, Nelly. Okay. <laughs> Since not insulted, Letty's great. Letty's next. Right? <laughs> yeah. Not yet. You will be. But uh, yes, since you, uh, Nelly, you did mention something about special ed, and there is uh -huh. a question related to it that I, sure. I'm going to uh, post to you. It says, um, what supports will be set in place to address the needs of students with, with IEPs? Your proposed models of online or hybrid teaching presents limitations with vulnerable student populations being able to get to the support they need. Many mm -hmm. parents are not trained or have the resources to teach children, especially ones with specialized needs from home. A very valid concern and a great challenge for uh, California and, and probably the entire nation being that the federal government did not put, um, put forth any waivers to the IDEA. Uh, therefore, everybody is in, um, needs to comply to uh, providing services for our students. And it's true, we, it's very difficult to, to reach our students 
through a digital connection um, for some of the services that they need. So those are, um, those are issues in which we will continue to negotiate to figure out how we can address the needs of our, of our um, students who receive services. Thank you, Nelly. Mm -hmm. Nelly. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Uh, it's a, you are right. Uh, that's a big concern for many of our families. So I'm glad you addressed it a little bit. There's work to be done for sure, but it's, uh, it's good information for them to have. And now, Leticia Oropesa, thank you for waiting so patiently. Of course. Um, would you please provide us CSEA's perspective um, uh, on this and, and the top priorities for reopening the school? Absolutely. First of all, good evening. And I'd like to thank Dr. Rodriguez for uh, inviting me this evening um, to address a very important matter in the district. We, we too, Classified School Employees Association, CSCA support staff, perhaps for those who are not aware of um, who we are and what we do. We are the support staff and are there to do exactly that in every capacity other than the teaching. Our, one of our priorities is safety. Safety for staff, safety for absolutely the students, safety for self. So we have professionals throughout the district who are um, very knowledgeable of what needs to be done as far as cleaning, cleaning after events, cleaning after daily throughout the, throughout the day, actually, we'll be cleaning. Um, they are going to be wearing their protective gear um, and be available to just maintain the most cleanest environment possible so that students, staff is uh, in as healthy as, an environment as possibly can be done. And we are um, a, a bit apprehensive about returning, but also excited about seeing students and teachers and, and being supportive. Many of us are at work. Many of us have, have not stopped working. Um, again, bills need to be paid, right? So our, our, there's classified staff there all the time. Bills need to be paid, parents need their questions answered, um, et cetera. So the building has continued. Technology, my goodness, you know, look at technology's um, entire event here from the beginning, cleaning Chromebooks, distributing Chromebooks, there to support families on the phone with um, a hiccup. Um, as Nelly mentioned, there are many parents who are not familiar with um, with this type of teaching. So our technology department has been there ready, prepared to walk people through and, uh, you know, our, our entire classified um, staff is to be commended because they have done an amazing job and are, have always put their best foot forward and will continue to do that because um, safety is their number one priority. We are going to enter into negotiations to discuss reopening and um, nail down some dates today. So I'm looking forward to that as are many of the classified employees. We were finally able to, able to get our representative on board because um, he's been so busy, but brings a wealth of experience uh, and other information that can be very useful for our members. And we welcome those that are coming back to school and we welcome those that are, will continue uh, virtually. We are here to support. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you. you know, um, you actually answered one of very important question that I had staged for you, that, that I had uh, ready for you, that mm -hmm. who will be responsible for cleaning surfaces that are constantly used, touched, during the school day, like doorknobs, yes. desks. So you touched on all of that. I really appreciate that because it's certainly something that our community wanted to hear. So I'm going Absolutely. to give you a question that you uh, you may answer because okay. it's related to that support, making kids feel good, no? And uh, the question is in Spanish, I'll read it in English. My son is afraid of returning to school. He says that, uh, that uh, if it's, 
if he has to come to school, if he can do it virtually. He w doesn't want to come to school unless it's virtually. Right. What would you say to that? that so I, I would tell the, the child, you know, the, the parent and the child that we are here to support them um, regardless of whether they want to come to school physically or virtually. Perhaps they can try it. Um, we are trying and going to do our best to keep them safe. We will, as Dr. Rodriguez explained, have the face mask or the face shield, which actually I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Um, so I think that that would be something that I would say to the parent um, to try and ease their child's mind about coming to school and just making sure that they see that everyone is wearing some protective gear, that everyone has a smile and is supportive and is friendly and um, make them feel comfortable and safe. Thank you. That's very wonderful. Um, Thank you. We have, did you want to say something, Dr. Rodriguez? Um, no, I'll wait for the next question. Okay, so I actually have a question for the panel. So whomever wants to step up and answer it, uh, that would be wonderful. The question is, isn't it in the best interest for, and it's regarding uh, students in special needs. Isn't it in the best interest for children TK through sixth grade with an IEP learning disability band non-IEP learning challenges need to have in-person small group learning support by professional elementary and RSP teachers at least half days, three to five days a week? So would, would one of you like to take it or would you like me uh, to take it? I think you would be the best to respond. Are you okay, Nelly, with res me responding first? Sure, go ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, because I think it is on here for, for the parents. So this is where, when we look at the decision tree and we look at high risk, you'll see that we are saying that, you'll see that this says and or, right? So we are saying that a large percentage of the students would start the school year with remote learning. And we are saying that um, specifically, our 4th through 12th grade students would mostly be in this category. We do have the K-12 virtual option, which I know we have several questions about, but I'll focus on this down here. So we, I think all three of us want what, what is safe and possible for kids, right? So if we could... Um, have it to where we could safely bring every child back to school, I believe that we would all want that to happen. Um, so what our goal is, is to bring back the, the students that need it most first. So that is where it talks about by age. So when we look at and focus in-person learning for small groups, um, we're talking about the youngest of students and then we also have here identified need. So students who re will receive learning um, with appropriate modification. So we know that some special education students, some non-participating students really need that support. And so that's why when we go to these school groupings, that's why we have said here that students TK to three will attend school two days a week with no more than a 12 to one ratio. Again, trying to, as Nelly was mentioning, trying to lower that ratio down. Um, and that for st students in grades four through five will do distance learning for the majority, right, of the time with limited small group in-person instruction. And once we identify that, that will be based on small, on, um, on identified needs. You'll see that we have that as well for the sixth through 12th grade students. Um, so we will be reaching out, the special education um, department will be reaching out to parents as we look at um, how can we best support um, those students um, within a small group setting um, safely. 
um, so that we can continue to have our schools open. Um, and I don't know if one of you would like to add on to that or um, we can go to the next question. It's up to you. I, I think that most uh, that teachers would agree with you, our special ed teachers, many of them are wanting to, to be able to help with you know, their students in person, but of course that they're being you know, protective equipment and that it be a safe learning environment. Sure. Mm -hmm. Same for classified. I just received a call yesterday where they're um, very enthusiastic about returning, but are concerned with the uh, distancing. Understood. Okay. All right, Alicia, what next? So we do have another uh, question for the panel. Um, and any one of you can um, talk about it. It's a very important question for our community. The plan does not address bilingual classes. Will there be any changes? So I, because I don't work in a bilingual program, but as what I understand with distance learning with our teachers is that they continued, they created a program that still met the needs of their students as best as possible in the time, you know, as, as we entered a pandemic, everybody, everything was just so, I think the common word was fluid and it was changing every, every day. But I believe that our teachers did an, an exceptional job um, addressing the learning needs of their students while still at the same time providing bilingual instruction. And, um, and so as we move into planning to start a year and potentially being an entire year in, in this type of learning modality, it, it's, the bilingual education is still going to be happening. Thank so you. I concur that we mm -hmm. have, um, we believe that the additional languages that our children bring to the schools is an asset and we wanna continue to support that. And so um, there shouldn't have been, um, I, I know that the teachers and support staff feel very strongly in continuing to support the bilingual programs and so, I feel confident that they continue to provide that bilingual um, instruction and they will um, continue to do so, I'm sure, as the year moves on. Thank you. Leticia, do you have anything to add? No, absolutely. We have many bilingual staff, many instructional assistants, behavior techs in the um, educational program, and they are ready to, to work with students. Some are even working summer school and providing Spanish instruction. Great. So yes. Lisa, I actually did want to add on because I had forgotten. I think it's a good point for our parents who have their children in bilingual classrooms. For English, we have a program that's called Lexia um, for support in English. Um, we did just purchase iStation for our bilingual classrooms, which is, uh, is a similar version. So it helps support foundational literacy in Spanish. Um, so I did want to mention that we are ramping up um, digital programs um, for our, our um, bilingual classrooms as well. And iStation was purchased for them. Wonderful. Well, so it is, it is happening and it's getting better. That's what we know, right? So I think we, we have about seven to 10 more minutes. I'm going to pose one more question to the panel and then we're gonna wrap it up, okay? Okay. This is the, uh, the question. I am a parent, as a parent to a child going into kindergarten, what can we do as parents to prepare them for a much different school experience than the one they had in kindergarten? What would you say? I would say um, that beginning to just teach the, your, your child how to wash their hands on their own um, and just kind of teaching them some of those responsibilities of like feeling like a like they're a growing child and they're um, able to, to do as much as they can um, to initiate uh, certain needs that they might have. So um, having only, I've, I've raised two children, <laughs> but uh, having not been a kindergarten teacher, I could only imagine that it would be to ensure their, their child that when, when they go into a small classroom setting, um, that everybody cares about everybody, but that there's also um, space that needs to be respected. Um, 
and then just like I said, it's, you know, washing hands and uh, just letting them know like some things they might notice in regards to uh, routines mm -hmm. in the classroom or, or in, in, in hygiene. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nelly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I, I have to say the same thing, just recognizing that, that it's, it is different. It's mm -hmm. part of growing up also. Um, personal space and um, cleanliness those are two and it, it's already scary as a parent right to to feel like you're sending your child off now to kindergarten so um just a sense of letting your child know reassure them and their their own um personal space excellent it's changing times so for, for me, I would say um, a couple of things. One, that um, ensure that your child um, knows that their teacher, their principal, um, the staff around them cares for them. And so to um, vocalize their needs, to say what they need, um, to tell the parent what they need, um, what they physically need. Um, that even though things are different, um, it doesn't necessarily have to feel bad, right? It can be different and just be different. Um, and then um, to take advantage of the supports that we have, right? So whether it's Footsteps to Brilliance, which is a program that helps with literacy, or it's um, Map Accelerator, um, encourage, know what your child is doing in class and try to be um, the best support that you can be. So I have, for my, most of my son's life, I had a real, I have had a really challenging job that has been very time consuming. So I have not been able to be a parent that um, sits down with my child at the dinner table for hours at a time because I um, did not have that type of work schedule. But what I did do is I made sure that my child knew that I knew what he was supposed to be doing and that I supported that effort. So whether you have 10 minutes with your child or you have three hours with your child, engage with them and in encourage them to, um, to do their best at all times because um, that will then build the foundation for them to have a successful rest of their educational career. Thank you. So we are running out of time. So maybe a minute and a half each uh, to wrap it up. Um, anything you want, any last words you'd like to say to our audience? Let's start with you, Leticia. So I would um, encourage you as both uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Nelly have said to to engage as well, to vocalize um, with the principal, the teacher, staff, what are your needs? You know, echoing the same thing to the, to the parent. We need to know in order to be your partner and you and your, chi your child and you be successful in um, coming to school and being at school. To our classified division, we, um, we will get through this. You are amazing group of people and um, we may have a few changes here and there like everyone else, but we will accomplish our goals. And our goals is to um, continue doing our work and to keep schools safe and clean. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Nelly? Nicely said, Leticia, thanks. Um, yeah, and so um, for our for our community, uh, it's it's these have been um, uncertain times, and uh, and but also there is the silver lining has been that despite the physical distancing, I feel that there's been a lot of social reconnecting and connecting, um, mm -hmm. and so as we move back into going back to school, just being patient and understanding that it's not the school in the traditional sense. Yeah. Um, so that it's, it is going to require some, um, some patience in the expectations that we've already, that we've had of how school works. Some of those things are going to be different. And, um, and so just being able to understand that 
and so that we could all continue to work together. Um, CSEA has, has done a tremendous job in making sure that our students are fed, that our sites are maintained, that the, you know, the paperwork is still moving along in our district. And, and, um, and so that's all important. And we're all part of an important piece in, in public education for our community. So as for our community, I ask that there's a patience and definitely um, vocalizing, just um, letting us know what it is, what it is that um, would be would work for you and how, so that we can then see how we can best address that. Um, for our membership, we're still in negotiations and we understand the importance of safety and the importance of um, and what comes with funding um, <laughs> our safety. Um, and then as, as well as training so that when we all come back together, it's um, with, with preparation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. And Doctora, you take the last two minutes to wrap it up. Okay, sounds good. So most importantly, I just, um, I encourage everyone to take the survey. So we are going to be providing paper surveys if you need it at our food distribution sites. So we have already, you know, about 1,400 1500 responses. We want to try to get many more than that. We had 7,000 responses almost to our first survey. So please continue whether you are a staff member, a community member, or a student from fourth to sixth, for fourth to 12th grade, please fill out the survey um, because I think Nellie said it well. We need to be able to try to find solutions to issues. Um, challenges and issues that our teachers, our staff, and our community have um, in an effort to best serve our students. Um, so the survey is going to be open until Friday at the end of the night, so please make sure and, and fill that out. Um, please know that all these decisions um, are taken with us believing um, that um, the health and safety, both the emotional, physical, and um, mental health of your, of your children is the most important. Um, we are here to serve the community and we're here to support. Um, there are multiple ways if you, as we said, we have a lot of questions in little time. So if you have additional questions, you can also either email me directly if you would like, or you can send it to um, at Ask Dr. Rodriguez. There's a link there. Um, this past couple of weeks, I have had under 10 questions asked of me. So that's a definite way that you can get your questions asked if you want. Um, because we, our goal is to communicate and have people understand the rationale um, behind what we are doing. Um, please make sure that during, I'd be remiss to say, it, because we have quite a few people watching, please make sure your child was provided their Chromebook and left with their hotspot so that they could continue to engage with our digital programs. So remember that learning has not ended. We do have um, not only the summer school STEAM site um, website available, but we have all of our digital programs. And so I'd encourage you to have your child, um, regardless of the age, half hour a day, it's not much, half hour a day engage with some type of learning um, and um, keep that going. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, please note that we um, will be cutting the streaming and then within a minute, um, we will be re um, doing this session again in Spanish. Um, so thank you very much to the rest of um, the community out there. My guests, they're gonna stay on. Um, and thank See you, you at 615. Thank you to all the community.